was <laughs> to, get, just to give an opportunity to talk about some things maybe that got rushed to one slide. You guys are very chatty today. Um, also, just to, if there's things that, you know, some topics you can like to expand upon at all, this would be the opportunity. Also, people in, in um, participating in VAU stream, please feel free to do that. Um, one, of the, one of the questions I've always wanted to ask, and it's a little off the topic of everything you guys discuss. Um, when you got started dealing with digital collections, like really trying to plan this through, you guys all, all talked about that there was there's mistakes and missteps and what's really Could you address what collection you started with or what type of collection you started with? And then um, if you could do it over again, would you have done a different type of collection as your as your big first dive into digital curation? I'll, I'll start. Um, our first collection of Emory was, as I mentioned in my talk, um, the original material that was um, included in the personal interview that was on the brush team. Um, it was completely insane to start with that collection, but we also were mandated to do so. Um, our um, senior administrators really wanted to um, couple the opening of the more digital archives with the opening of the paper and the opening of the big huge exhibit that we did as part of this, the paper opening. So we were given a date um, that we needed to have to at least some, um, we did negotiate now <laughs> to just having a, a set of data at the earliest in the data ready. Um, so I mean, I think the, the advantage is that we just jumped in with both feet um, because it was a senior administrative manager We were given loads of resources to get it done in about 14 months. Um, and you know, there's something about the adrenaline of that kind of a deadline and that much work that needs to be done that can be built in a lot of front loads, a lot of excitement into the <laughs> into the development of a, of a new program. Because if we didn't really have a we did not have a digital archives program at the point that went back to the So it was a great motivator and it's had some really great outcomes. But it meant that in some ways, like we had the cart for the horse because we were so focused on getting at least some of the material accessible by February 2010 that um, we didn't have some of the key infrastructure elements in place for sort of programmatic processing, programmatic acquisition, programmatic storage. So, pros and cons. I mean, I think my scenario was very different, um, similar into, in, you know, sort of workflow or infrastructure existed, but um, not so much of sort of a, a timeline or a deadline for a particular collection. So like I sort of talked about, I, I sort of looked at, here's all the existing war materials in our collections, which for the scale actually of our department was not um, overwhelming or insurmountable. Um, and so I was looking at actually, what are the, what are the basic things that I need to do, um, like I said, to sort of prepare these materials for preservation and access. So not even thinking about, I need to take this one collection and move from, from the disk in the box to having you know some sort of version online. Actually just dealing from disk in a box to network storage, you know, some basic sort of uh, bid level sort of integrity. So Chris mentioned checksum. So something in you know, a couple copies in different places. Something that's one step better than where it was. Um, but applying that to a number of different collections, a number of accessions, um, and and through that process, sort of determining where um, where sort of the simple, easy collections were, either just like a few files or you know, homogenous, something you're talking about, your sort of tiers of processing, and where the more complex collections were that I knew were going to need potentially more resources or more effort. Um, so that's that's really been my approach of just sort of moving at least what existed to a better place and then being able to determine um, from there sort of where the priorities are for a collection, sort of collection by collection, processing and description and what access looks like. Um, although recently we did sort of have a little bit of a deadline with the collection that we acquired um, since I've been there, um, but then that also changed due to some, some amount of need for additional clarification on restrictions around the electronic materials. It's like the big collection, everything is supposed to be 
again, a part of an exhibit and some sort of big announcement, but electronic materials, there seem to be a little it's clarification needed. So, um, well, restrictions. Yeah. Right. It, <clears throat> for me, it was actually, well, there's a combination of things that, that happened that, that forced us to, to deal with this in a, in a systematic way. Um, on the one hand, we had a very specific collection need that we needed to address. Uh, we had a faculty member from our chemistry department who had um, passed away. And the, um, I don't think he was the chair of chemistry at the time, School of Chemical Sciences. But anyway, a very uh, influential faculty member said, hey, I think you ought to be preserving this guy's material because he developed the first online curriculum for teaching chemistry. This was back using uh, some of the Department of Defense funded projects in the 1970s. And we had, so, so anyway, hey, this guy's important, um, you know, chemistry education, uh, use of computer technologies, we need to preserve his stuff. And that was actually the office I showed in the first slide. So now when we had to work through a set of very specific steps, I, I didn't go into all of this, but we did all the disk imaging types of things that, that um, you know, we were talking about here. We actually had a very uh, crazy process. We had to outsource some of this work because there was a crazy uh, optical media format that IBM had developed. And we could only find one guy anywhere in the country that could convert this thing. It looks like a CD, except it's in a three and a half inch. If you looked at it, it looked like a, a three and a half inch flop or quarter, whatever it is, floppy drive. But inside there was a little mini CD instead. So we had to we had to image all of that stuff. Um, ultimately, that that didn't prove full value to us. But as part of that, we worked out some specific workflow issues for dealing with the digital stuff. How are we going to take out materials that are private? How are we going to develop this access copy? So on. How are we going to describe this in our catalog system? So we were doing that, and then at the same time, we had these 25 screens, I, I would say, are trickles of digital stuff that was coming into the archives. And we're a very um, entrepreneurial organization. And it's like herding cats, getting people to follow the process. So more or less, people had things stored everywhere in our file system. And we, people had access to like 25 different file locations. So we had to try to draw all of that together in one big pot. It was after that was all drawn together in one pot that I realized, hey, we've actually got a few terabytes of stuff. We've got a big problem here. And it says things like built environment and you know assembly hall files. I'm like, where did it come from? You know, what's the chain of custody here? Oh, um, Joanne, do you have any idea what these oh yeah, that's the you know, I, I've got some email about it, I'll forward it to you. You know. So so we had these two big problems. We had one one very specific project and, and also a very big scale problem. of materials that you create the cataloging record and I would like to know how soon the record is available to users and what cataloging system, what local cataloging system you have? Um, that's for Chris, right? For me. Yeah, we have, uh, we have this uh, collections management system called Archon, which is a piece of open source software that uh, we actually developed at the University of Illinois. Um, and part of it is there's a digital object management system or, or section of it. So you can record certain pieces of metadata in there. Um, actually, if we were to go back and do it, I would do it a little bit different than the way we have it now. But more or less, we try to record the, the, the recommended metadata fields from describing archives and content standard. So we'll have a, a field for uh, you know, a narrative description. Um, we'll have subjects that are applied. So forth. But you could use anything. I mean, you could use a, you could do mark records if you wanted to in a regular catalog. You could use um, archivist toolkit or archive space. It doesn't really matter. The important point is having it done consistently and in a system that you you can support locally. Uh, one question that just came in 
Are any of you using specific tools for arrangement and description? And have you done A and D to very large collections? So um, I can say that we were experimenting using <coughs> some of the existing tools that are included in the curator I mentioned that from the German talk. Um, the only collection that we've done extensive, what I would call sort of traditional, more traditional extensive A and D work on has been the Rushdie material, and that has not really the tools in the archivist, loads of loads of IML review, um, loads of regular expression searching, um, and then um, assigning using CSV files to assign scripts and metadata and piping that into our built Fedora based repository. Nothing that's easy to pass off to others for me. <laughs> I think, I think this is a, a big need, um, and one of the outcomes of the Ames project was sort of the, both a conceptual model and sort of some sort of potential functions of what an arrangement description tool could look like for more digital materials. Um, so, and, and really thinking about um, how much do we need to um, sort of implement traditional and arrangement description procedures and sort of methods into the more digital space and how do we how do we do that in a way recognizing that while the bits live on physical media there's still sort of this logical relationship between you know a bunch of ones and zeros that make up a given file and that you know opportunities for tools that allow us to come up with some amount of arrangement but also that that may not ultimately for researchers, and how do we provide researchers and users with access to files, with access to data, um, in all kinds of different ways. And so there's there's sort of this um, concept that came out of that, but there hasn't been a lot of movement on trying to actually develop something like that and make it work. Um, and I think it's going to take more people sort of calling for that and coming up with specific sort of scenarios on um, what that could look like and how it can function to continue to make more progress. Yeah, I, I would yeah, just reiterate what Lori has said. Um, we, we don't have a specific arrangement and description tool. Um, I, I can tell you conceptually what we're doing is that we know we want to provide access to the records somehow. We know that certain pieces of information need to be removed. Um, you know, uh, and, and we also know that we want to have a copy of it online, and we want to have a copy of it that's not online. So to take the example, I was I was citing this uh, chemistry professor Stanley Smith. Um, what we what we do in practice is we keep the all the original files turned over to us. I turn it over to somebody and say, okay, I've looked at this collection. Um, I believe that these are the primary activities that he was engaged in. And I looked at the files and said, I think if we structure the access copy in this way, it'll it'll be pretty it'll be pretty good access for users. So what we'll typically do is say, okay, here's the guy's teaching files, here's correspondence. We'll kind of break it down like you would with standard series, you know, in the, the traditional archival description. And that's for the online copy, so users can go over that, they can browse through the files and look them. This offline or nearline copy, we try to keep that pretty close to the original copy and its original structure. So what I found is that people will come and say, well, yeah, I can put this thing online, but I want to see it how he originally had it. And I want to sort it my own ways. I want to apply my own tools to it. You know, we had one gentleman that came to us and said, oh, I've got this great um, data mining application. I'd like to turn loose on these files. We'll find it. You know, so I'm not overly worried. I mean, I want to provide it in a way that people can do whatever they want with it using their own tools. So yeah. the range of the description piece bothers me a lot less than it used to address. I think right. that, like, that, that line between what we need as archivists and processing and what researchers need to pursue their research, like, I think it's the same, largely the same sort of tools. 
It is, yeah. And so if it's the same set of tools, how much do we need to do on the archive side and how much can we just offer original order right. and the right tool set? You know, you make it, you know, deduplication and things like that. But I, I mean, I think there, that is a real question in my mind. Like how, you know, how much range of description do we need yeah. with, with more digital material? Because it is so much more easily, easily, more easily mined, to use that word. You know, you can just, I think you can ask questions of more digital data that you can't as easily and quickly ask of paper, paper material. So I think it's, uh, it's an interesting sort question. Of, sort of the, the browse versus the search scenario. Mm -hmm. So if we're seeing more researchers who even just of our existing description of paper analog, regardless of format, want to be able to search across collections, want to be able to refine and sort of facet things and sort of limit their searches, even just of just textual description of at whatever collection or series level, um, then there obviously are similar calls for that regardless of whether it's more digital. Um, and so having those opportunities um, versus you know imposing some amount of structure um, to what level we think is useful. But and so this is also, I think, maybe sort of like a feedback loop as well. I'm not sure we sort of talking to our researchers and users and getting a sense of for the sort of potential of access and use for these materials, what it, where should that start from? And how much effort should we be and putting think, into right. that? And that was that impact, like when I was talking a little bit about impacts on the different parts of the memory, you know, I think that could have a huge impact on research services. Because if all of right. a sudden we're right. you know, loading up our um, sort of virtual reading room, if you will, with all of these network mapping, data visualization, data mining tools. Where, I mean, I feel like how much is it our kind of demonstrating, here's some really great things you can do with our data. Even if you've never used these tools before, never even heard of these tools, like here's some, I feel like there's gonna be a little push and pull, right? To get, to, to sort of introduce to maybe researchers who've not ever dabbled in digital humanities or scholarship before, but who have this really strong like, traditional article and methodology training. Like, right. Here's a whole new set of tools that you can use on a whole new set of contents. And yeah, it's pretty amazing. There. Yeah, I, I think those digital humanities tools, are, they're certainly something that's critical for us in our planning as well. Um, one of the stories I had thought of including in the I was talking about things I learned the hard way, actually was with one of our um, early experiments with one of those tools where I had received this big image of files and I thought, well, I'm going to demonstrate to the donor what can be done with this stuff. So we, we overlaid a topic model on, um, on this drive and it, it indexed, you know, the, the 25,000 text files or whatever were in there and I sent the link to the, to the, to the um, person's assistant and she's like, wait, wait, you can't do anything with this. I can see all of this confidential stuff. Yeah. So it's just like, it's really, really powerful, but it has to be introduced to people in the proper way. And um, the other thing that's, I think, interesting with those is they have a particular use, but they can also end up imposing a particular interpretation on the records that's not necessarily um, right. Not that, that, that kinds of ends up destroying um, the contextual value or what we like to think of as archivists is the authenticity. So for example, with this particular tool, it was showing particular records, um, but then you had no way to get back to see the entire chain of emails or whatever that created right. because they tend to treat everything as an item and they don't necessarily preserve right. the broader record structure. That's, so that's I think there's a huge. push and pull, that's you know, using important. those tools that's going to become more uh, obvious over the next couple of years or so. I think that's true of any set of tools or methodologies or principles that you bring into our field or other field. I, mean, I think the same thing is true of digital forensics, right? Like, we're drawn to the digital forensics tools because there's a lot of common ground between, strangely, between criminal justice law enforcement and, and archives. Like, we're both interested in authenticity, we're both, like, both interested in chain of custody. The outcomes we're after, seriously different, right? Like, we don't really plan to indict anyone for anything. You know, you're just preserving the cultural record. So I think as we're learning like, through the big curator work and some of the AIMS analysis that came out of that project, is like, yes, there's some tools there that are, that are 
really potentially useful for us, but we probably need to put some effort to, to customizing them, tweaking them, revising them slightly so that they more effectively see our needs. And I think the same thing will be true with digital humanities tools, like especially this idea of, of context and treating a corpus as a corpus and not as a group of individual and discrete items. So I think yeah, as we move into that, just be really mindful that they're useful, they have a lot of potential, but they're not like off the shelf going to be right on, dead spot on, perfect for what we want. Both on the processing side and the access side. <coughs> and I think I think the context, sorry, I think the context piece is sort of it's it's the big thing, right? That that's that's what we're doing throughout all of these different these different phases and steps and a workflow or whatever. It's trying to maintain that context. And increasingly, you know, there's there's tools that sort of that play roles in capturing technical context, so things about files and systems. But there's still really the importance of, of getting that descriptive context either from the creator or from the donor, that sort of larger level, um, that you don't need a fancy tool to do that. I mean, that's just a conversation. You have some notes or, or whatever. And that ends up ultimately informing what some amount of description looks like for those materials, um, whether it's an organization or an individual. Um, so. Yeah, while we talked a lot about tools and all that, it's still there's still a lot of work that can be done, um, and it, it really is some of the most important work that's done, um, regardless of the format of the materials. Yeah. Okay, uh, a few more questions have come in online. First of all, I guess for any of you, what have what have you found to be the most surprising aspect of dealing with born digital records? I'm, I'm 
working on, um, but um, what we are generating um, at least is, you know, the the archival information package for the given set of files or data using using Archivematica mostly right now, um, and that at least allows us to have that the content and all the metadata, all the preservation of metadata mapped or sort of mapped up and, and wrapped up according to the sort of existing standards and best practices, and that lives in a sort of a basic IT network storage environment that has uh, multiple backups. Um, we're also using cloud storage, Amazon Glacier, for our sort of high priority digital content, both uh, digitized materials um, and the more digital content as well. Um, and those, to me, I, I see those as sort of interim good enough solutions, um, but what we're working towards is something where archival storage also includes monitoring, right? So monitoring what's going on with those files, have they changed, have they been corrupted, do we need to sort of replace them with another version? Obviously, cloud being sort of distributed storage, so there are other sort of distributed storage strategies we could consider. Um, and also, um, sort of long-term technology and format monitoring that even the formats that we agreed upon right now as a community or as preservation standards, those might change. Um, or what is considered sort of non-standard now, we might come up with a standard for that. So what future sort of migration or other preservation strategies have to, have to be um, undertaken? But for now, even just getting things to the point that they have the content and sort of the technical and descriptive metadata is a, is a good place to be, even if that isn't in some sort of much more robust storage situation. Um, yeah. And I'll say yeah, it's only been very recently that we've had um, true preservation storage for these images. And so before that, we were um, keeping checksums, trying to, when we could, do, um, all, we had local, we tried to have very local, so this was totally not about the preservation standards. So we did, we tried to have at least two copies. But it was all within like the same frame. Um, one was all one, one was on a, one of our huge we have one, one, one workstation that's got actually great storage. Um, and we had checksums assigned, and again, we, we could get from data health that we had the checksums. But you know, now that we have, where they, we have the capacity to ingest our disk images, um, those are in, you know, those are in right? There's data fixity, there's full audit, audit trails that um, you can rely on. So there's premise, so any major preservation that's recorded, um, and there is, um, because we're part now from the enterprise storage system at Emory, I mean, there's um, three copies, um, one of which is not fit located, so that's pretty sound. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when I was um, identifying some of our deviants, um, we do have some individual files that we acquired in kind of pinky ways, and so those we are still doing as local storage because we don't yet have an effective way to do individual file adjust. So we still have a depth and a hybrid approach. Yeah, and actually, I mean, we have, the, the approach we have is very much hybrid as well. Um, we, well, well, backing up a bit, I mean, what we have is a network file store that we put things on right now. If you were to look at it, there's simply a folder on there that says electronic records repository. And then for each collection, there's a folder with the identifier for that collection as it's described in our database. Within that uh, individual file, there's a folder. There's a folder for the preservation copy, and then both of the access copies. Uh, at one point, we were generating checksum values for those as well, using you know some tools. Um, but we stopped doing that because currently with us getting this organized, the library began setting up a broader digital preservation system for any kind of locally created digital content. So the results of all the scanning projects, um, <clears throat> you know, whatever else is going on in the library, this infrastructure is being set up and it includes within it all the types of things that both Sam and Eric were talking about, you know, um, when things are ingested, there'll be a premise record created and it'll use um, It'll use descriptive information from our descriptive catalog system, 
descriptive metadata, and then there'll be an ingest event. There'll be all of the other things that, that the system should do. It will actually, at the time it's ingested, it will, it will store five copies of it, believe it or not. Two locally in our library, one um, on another part of campus, about, about a mile away, so it's far in F5 tornado, it's probably fine. Um, and one in Chicago, and then one on Amazon Glacier. So, so that's all in the future. For right now, there's just two copies of it being kept. It's all staged up. Like I was saying, the, the critical thing is being very consistent in the way these are stored, so that when it's ingested, there's a way to link the metadata in, um, you know, and, and ingest descriptive metadata to them, to the actual print files that are being preserved. But yeah, it's all this. This is basically file system storage. I mean, I have a map drive map to my computer, and that's it. different with more digital materials is 
um, the conversations can be harder and more pointed because typically the material is a lot closer in time uh, to, to, that you're seeking to acquire. Uh, whereas a lot of times with um, paper-based materials, it's been sitting somewhere by the time we get to it for you know, 10, 20 years, maybe even further. And at that point, usually people don't really care a whole lot anymore. There'll have been some privacy concerns that they had or personal concerns about it, but um, when, you're, when you're dealing with them, they're just less sensitive because time has passed and they have um, you know, some perspective. So that, that can be difficult. The other thing that I think makes it different with born digital is usually with the paper-based material, we're meeting a very immediate need that the donor has, which is to clean out some space, right? I mean, realistically, this is what motivates a lot of donations. You know, we've got this office that needs to be cleaned out because X, Y, or Z faculty member is coming and we need to remodel it. Um, so, you know, the digital stuff can continue piling up, but there's no need typically to move it out because space isn't an issue. So we've, we've removed that element from, from their needing us, you know, and uh, so you have to be more proactive, I would say. Um, typically what I'll do is we'll work on acquiring some physical materials, and then at a certain point, I'll say, hey, have you ever thought about any digital materials? Because look, this record runs out around, you know, around the year 2000 and, and, and there's going to be a lot of other interesting stuff that happened. Oh yeah, we've got a computer, you know, so it, it's just a matter of knowing the right time to bring up things. Um, not trying to force things through. I, I've had some experiences with other people that have, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's interesting like the data curation movement. Uh, it can be Depending on how it's approached, there can be a, it can be kind of like we're going to come in and tell you how to manage your data, and then that's not going to work. I think that community has realized that. So it's more finding out what people's needs are. I like to ask a lot of questions and just spend an hour asking people to tell me about their research. And they'll do that. People like to talk about themselves. Once they've done that, then you soften them up, you know. So. <laughs> And usually a lot of them have lived, they mean, you wouldn't be acquiring if they hadn't lived interesting lives. You want to find out about them anyway. You know, that all comes into understanding the context for the records and then explaining that to users later, part of the descriptive record. And I will say on the heels of that, I've found that like, I'll ask as part of our acquisition survey a series of questions that have to do with like, who else uses your computer, what, what applications do you use, and sometimes I'll get to, like these really kind of sparse answers. And then I'll ask, Oh, well, talk to me about your literary production process. Like, what is it like? What is your writing process like? And then they'll start, you know, I'll get them talking about the thing they love, right? And then I'm hearing all these things, you know, about computer use and computer habits. And so I will second that notion of like asking them about their research or asking them about what it is, what it, what it is they do. Because often, you know, they go, oh, why all you like computer for this and no one else uses it. And then you hear that there's like two graduate students systems, you all use the same computer, all the same account, you know, you really, um, or you, like I learned recently with the poet, we just acquired uh, his papers, I was chatting with him about his process, and he was talking about how he's accrued uh, all of these different versions of word, because he's very interested as a poet in how, in the control he has over formatting within the word processing application, so he literally had like six versions of word. And you know, I might have just thought, oh, but like, what does it doesn't really matter. But it actually is a key part of the literary process that you know, he didn't mention when I was asking about the, the different applications he uses. So I think that getting them to sort of open it up about their processes can be really productive. Yeah. The other thing I will add, um, and try not to get too theoretical, <laughs> but I think I think what's interesting about acquiring and dealing with foreign digital materials, there are some sort of implications for our traditional theories and principles. So even this idea of provenance, so just the exact scenario that you outlined of sort of multiple creators involved in either a single work or multiple works, you know, and obviously this is, you know, in the idea of an organization, there's lots of people that are involved, so it's not like it's without precedent, but, you know, how do we sort of manage and maintain 
that, that sort of multiplicities of provenance um, that can be inherent to these materials, um, and how do we how do we sort of how do we relate that to description um, and our sort of descriptive standards? And I'm not saying we should you know completely radically modify what we're doing, but I think I think there as as more institutions and more people start to work with these materials, I think I think there is potential there to think about how do we sort of respond and adapt and still provide sort of useful uh, descriptive and descriptive systems and sort of access as well. Um, so those are things that I think about. Although I will say that more of my role um, is when sort of a collection is it's been decided that it's in scope and we are going to acquire it. Um, and sort of more of the technical issues, but very similar, I foresee very similar conversations in the future. It's like, you may ask a technical question, but you ask a process question, and we get different kinds of responses. I, I wanted to ask, um, Eric, you had brought it up that um, we're not doing a, a lot of um, keeping track of, of metrics or, or developing some metrics that we to evaluate what we're doing or to how we're doing these processes. And then one of the steps in your process again will come back tomorrow. You know, how do you how how do you measure that and then how do you assess its it, its um its success or failure? Uh, what kind of metrics do you think need to be out there or what that best case scenario, what what are you trying to find out about what you're doing all these measures? Yeah, I mean for us we have identified sort of a few set of a few processes for this year that we're trying to measure. They all have to do with this five stages of work. So, like roughly, like get for a given collection, identify a what that collection is and what the scope of it is, and then, you know, how long, how much work did go into pre-acquisition, how much work went into the actual transfer process, how much work, and we kind of we are using Red Red Boot. It was Team Box, I think it's Red Boot now, um, which is just an all-online like collaborative tool um, that lets you create tasks and you can actually uh, track how much effort you're doing. And so we're just trying to say, you know, get a sense of you know, how much more effort goes into data transfer when there's zero pre-acquisition. I think it's just being able to, but you can't answer those questions until you start measuring what you're doing. So we're measuring that. We're measuring um, effort that goes into the actual process of getting things ready to be ingested. We are not measuring the, the time it takes to ingest because that's largely a hands-off process and it can take up to like 18 hours. It can be really slow. It's something we start needing for big disk images and let just run. And so maybe like that's not really a fair measure because it's not like we're sitting there, you know, we're doing other things when that's happening. So, I mean, there are, and I think doc, we need to be really careful about documenting. I mean, numbers always seem so like, oh, I've got numbers for it now, but they can be as misleading as anything else. So, you know, I think we need to be, we're just starting this process, so I can't unfortunately give much more than like our hopes and dreams. But you know, we do need to be really clear and transparent about what we're measuring, how we're measuring it, what's not being measured, like that period of ingest. Um, but I think we are going to we are trying to measure, you know, if the first ingest fails, like how much time does it take for us to get about real labor to actually get a successful ingest? Like that's kind of a different question. Um, so. That's sort of where we are. And also measuring both our effort and um, where it's a little harder to measure other people, but when we can get information from them, the effort that goes into getting stuff ready for access from, from our software engineering is a sad thing. You know, we're not, we're not doing a lot of, actually we're not doing any assessment right now of our process and timing and things like that. We have a really good sense as to how long it takes to process a cubic flow of materials, and that can open up a box, almost any box, and tell you within 10 seconds how long it would take for somebody to cross. It is an exaggeration. <laughs> anyway, how long it would take somebody to process it. Um, but we don't we don't really have that, but it, it does make me think that it would be it would be good to have a relatively simple to say way to say, okay, here's a particular collection. Um, of a particular size and of, of complexity from say one to five, and then um, correlate that with how long the actual processing takes so that over time we could get a sense um, as to what expected resources we need. Um, 
I, I think it's critical. I mean, I, I know in our in our overall, we're, I mean, we're part of a broader organization, so every year we're asked to justify why we need these graduate assistants and so forth. And, and uh, we don't really have an effective way of managing it right now. So I actually really appreciate that question. It makes me think we need to start doing that. I think it could help with managing expectations, too. Because we have a curatorial staff at Marvel, and they'll get, like, I, I just feel like right now, when something comes in the door, I don't really have an effective way to talk to them about how much effort it's going to take to get something ready. And then, so like, as I was saying, those tiers of processing and the modes of access, these are like options, right? right. And so, yeah, I wish I could say to them, okay, you have this collection that has this kind of data, you want this tier of processing and this mode of access, it's going to mean that that's the only collection we can work on next year. Is that right. okay? Like, you know, to, and I, I, right. I feel like that's yeah. part of the conversation, and I um, can't really have it, right? I can, because I, don't, I just don't. I mean, I have some, I mean, I could probably say things like, that's not going to take two months. You know, I mean, I have some ballpark numbers, but I would like something a little more systematic. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That would be really good. Another dream. <laughs> right. No, it's very inspiring. I feel like where I'm at, and it's sort of things have matured enough to start thinking about trying to collect that kind of data on a regular basis. We'll see how it goes. Feedback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Question for Chris: um, Are high-level administrators more protective of their digital records than faculty members? And what donor relation techniques do you think work well in persuading administrators to part with their digital records? Um, I would say uh, they're not more protective as a general group. Um, it, it really is certain individuals, and it depends a lot on the function they're they're, they're doing. So. Um, the, the thing they're really protective about are records that um, are, relate to either protected intellectual property, um, relate to grievances on campus, uh, human resource issue, things that are really need to be restricted for legal reasons. My experience is most of the high level administrators have pretty well gotten um, and so to speak, on the idea of not having their personal business handled through their through their university accounts, so that's less of a concern than it has been. I would say some faculty are not hesitant at all to deal with with it. The one concern they, they do have is obviously with student records because those are protected um, depending on, on the nature of the under Family Educational Rights Privacy Act. They can be very protective if they have research records that um, they feel have some kind of a, uh, a value to them that they don't you know, want, want to let out, let out to others. I would say as far as the techniques are concerned, it's um, the, the thing that's been most effective for us is just being really, really explicit about what our, what our intent is and what our principles that will manage the materials on so, you know, we'll, we'll tell them, hey, we don't really have an interest in your personal material. If you want to turn it over to us, yes, we will take it. If, we, if you feel that it has value in helping people understand, you know, your activities, yes, we will take it, but we're not going to insist on it. Also telling them that it's our general operating principle that we're not going to just provide anyone access to this material. We'll have an access policy for it will need to get approval. Um, you'll have you know, a hand in shaping that access policy. So I think maybe people basically want to know that they have some input in, in control of getting the, the opportunity to have this for us. Can I, can I add something? Please do. <laughs> so, so one thing I've been thinking about for a while and then thinking about sort of in the context of our talks today, um, you know, we're all coming from university libraries um, that have archives departments or units, and so from a certain sort of resource level, right, um, and some variability, I'm sure, between all of us, um, and so thinking about our potential audience in the room and out there in the world, um, you know, who, who may be 
not not just the person assigned to deal with the digital stuff, but just the person who deals with all the stuff in their library or small museum or whatever. And 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 like I was talking about thinking about like where, where I started doing this work um, and sort of where the profession was at as far as best practices and projects and sort of tools and all of that. And I think I think even in over the past two or three years, things have, have come much further in if not something established, at least more headway for institutions at smaller levels, right? Who who aren't probably even thinking about how they're going to establish their formal preservation repository, right? And whether or not I'm actually going to do that in my library, that may be something that I sort of you know contract with a vendor or use some sort of services that are out there, um, and that those those types of things are still emerging. OCLC is working on. I'm not sure where they're at. This idea of Especially with the, we're talking, we're all talking about disk imaging, getting data off these old types of media. The idea that every institution is going to build out some sort of infrastructure to deal with that is, is not, that's not scalable. So they're working on this project to think about sort of network regional hubs that, you know, maybe it is a university library, or maybe it's some other nonprofit that provides those types of services. Because in the scheme of things, it's a fairly small window of, of history of media. Right, that we're dealing with, and, and they'll be around for a while, but in the future, it'll be some something else. So the need to have a bunch of technology and equipment around this particular case, um, you know, at every institution is not scalable. So I think as you, like at your institution, you know, thinking about um, what you can do, that I, I hope that what's happening is a lot of the sort of the technical, the more technical stuff, the things like getting data off of media, even what a preservation repository storage, a lot of those things may be other services that you need to know how they function, especially if you're sort of coming up with agreements that you're putting in place. Um, but but that really that work of the context, again, of sort of managing collections, you know, and, and sort of um, the descriptive information and all that sort of administrative work, that's something that we've always done with all kinds of materials, regardless of format. It's something that people can still do um, and, and don't necessarily need sort of higher level of technical knowledge. Um, so it's sort of managing what you can do right now with the resources you have, but also sort of, I think also trying to push the field and push the community as well, because it's a very responsive community. There's like lots of information sharing, but I think I think there's opportunities to sort of make things scale even further, sort of further out than where, where we're coming from. So I just wanted to, I've been thinking about that, I just wanted to throw that, throw that out there. Yeah, I, I think just to follow up on that, that's a really critical point um, for us as well. We, we've gotten to the point we begin developing this entire digital preservation infrastructure locally, which is a separate group of people for me. I mean, I don't, I don't actively do that. I talk with them regularly, and I, I kind of take care of the problems I can deal with as an archivist, which amount to, you know, a lot of the building of descriptive metadata and organizing the files in a good way. But even locally, we've gotten to the point where we said we can't support, we don't know that we can support a local preservation infrastructure. So we're looking at you know potential regional partnership. Um, so I think those are going to become increasingly common. There's great services out there that do this. Um, here in Illinois, uh, there's a project called Digital Power is looking at preservation environments for smaller and medium-sized institutions. And they've uh, done some testing with the Preservica service. And so there, there are other things out there that can handle the technical components of it, or there will be at least within the next couple of years. Keeping that in mind, I think, is, is critical, because there's a lot you can do without this fancy preservation infrastructure in place. And the, uh, the power acronym is P-O-W-R-R. Through Northern Illinois University's um, coordinating the project. Well, that's the perfect wrap up. Thanks for handing that to me. That was great. Um, I just want to thank everybody for participating. This was this was great, very informative. Um, hope you and the ether had a great great time and opportunity to answer ask questions and get your answers back. Um, I want to thank Rails for hosting this and the IT guys here for. Just <laughs> Great. Pip had many phone calls and emailed with me, so that was good. And to the three speakers for making the journey, I, I really appreciate that. And for all of you to be in the room, that was wonderful. 
lyricists will be posting the uh, tape of this, probably in sections by speaker and then by panel, to the Lyricist Preservation YouTube channel. And I will send out a message to everyone who registered in the room and virtually. When that happens, I'll let the speakers know as well. Um, there's been a conversation about whether slides are going to be available, and the speakers are all saying yes. So we'll get those slides up too and let everybody know about that as well. Um, Thank you for participating in the um, Lyricist Preservation Town Hall series. Um, thanks to NEH, thanks to Rails. Everybody have a great day. Thanks.